Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein. Let's get started. And today we're going through cardiology and we're doing it at the nursing fundamentals level. Let's begin with a little bit of anatomy and physiology. And you're likely familiar with a good background on this, but let's talk about some things that you'll need to know to understand cardiology at the nursing level. Remember the heart is a four chambered pump and remember its job is to pump blood throughout the body. The atrium are responsible for pumping blood to the ventricles, and the ventricles are responsible for pumping blood out. The right ventricle pumps blood out to the lungs. The left ventricle pumps blood out into central circulation. Cardiac output is how much does the heart actually pump out as a pump. And the calculation to this is stroke volume times heart rate. And let's figure out what this means. How much does the pump pump out in any given period of time? So let's use an example of one minute. If during one minute, the patient's heart rate was 70, then their heart rate is 70. That's how many times the heart pumped. And each pump, let's talk about the stroke volume. Each pump squeezes out. Let's use a number of 60 mLs. 60 mLs of blood are pumped out with each squeeze. So if we have 60 mLs of blood pumped out with each squeeze and 70 squeezes per minute, that is our cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. Next, let's talk about systole, which is the contraction of the heart, and diastole, which is relaxation of the heart. You may be familiar with these terms in the context of a patient's blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is what the pressure is during the contraction of the heart, the peak blood pressure at the peak contraction of the heart, as opposed to diastolic blood pressure is the blood pressure during diastole, during relaxation of the heart when it's not actively pumping this second. So systolic blood pressure is the pressure when the heart is contracting and diastolic blood pressure is the pressure when the heart is relaxed. Arteries always carry blood away from the heart and veins always carry blood to the heart. Let's talk a little bit about our cardiac assessment. Heart rate and blood pressure we're going to skip for now because that is covered in detail in the vital signs lecture that you could find separately. Capillary refill is another assessment tool that is sometimes used and a normal capillary refill is generally less than two or three seconds. Capillary refill is a way to identify how well a patient is being, the patient's blood is being circulated at their skin level. If the patient is shunting all their blood to their core because they're in shock, then it would be delayed because the body is not prioritizing sending blood to the skin. And we would pick up on that by assessing their capillary refill. Another part of our assessment are going to be heart tones or heart sounds. We're likely familiar that a normal heart has an S1 and an S2, commonly known as lub-dub. And then there are two other abnormal heart sounds, which are S3 and S4, and those are extra beats. And S3 can be indicative of heart failure or fluid overload. And an S4 can be indicative of stenosis, which is a narrowing or of hypertension. These are two abnormal heart sounds we may hear, S3 and S4. Please note, you may also hear other abnormal heart sounds, such as a murmur. However, those are discussed in future lectures. Point of maximal impact, or PMI, is a term you may hear, and it refers to a location on the heart, on the external part of the body, that you can, palp that you can palpate the actual pulse and that is on the fifth intercostal, remember that means between the ribs, the fifth intercostal space on the mid-clavicular line, and the mid-clavicular line is along the line that contains the nipple. Next on our cardiac assessment, we have an electrocardiogram, <clears throat> or ECG or EKG, those terms are interchangeable. An ECG is going to assess the electrical activity of the heart. So this is going to look at the patient's cardiac electrical rhythm. So this is where we would see normal sinus rhythm and we would see 
PQRST segments of the uh, cardiac cycle, all of the electrical activity of the heart we would see on an ECG. There are basic versions, which include a three, four, and five lead configuration. And then there's the comprehensive version, which is referred to as a 12 lead. There's also several variations of that, such as a 15 lead ECG. Next, we're gonna talk about some cardiology, cardiac terminology so that we understand these terms when we come across them. Cardiac refers to relating to the heart. Vasculature means relating to the veins, the arteries, and where they meet in the middle, which is the capillaries most of the time. Cardiovascular refers to the heart and the blood vessels together. A common example to use that term is in CV ICU or CV surgery, and that is cardiovascular ICU or cardiovascular surgery. Cardiac arrest is when the heart stops pumping. Nothing else constitutes cardiac arrest. When we perform CPR on a patient, when we give the patient compressions, it is because the heart is no longer pumping. If the heart still is pumping, we do not perform CPR. CPR is also not for a patient that just stops breathing. Again, CPR is when the heart stops pumping. A rapid response team is a term you should be familiar with. And this is when a team is called for a patient that had a sudden negative change in their condition. For example, they start seizing, or they suddenly no longer know where they are, or their blood pressure suddenly drops. All of these are sudden acute changes that would possibly necessitate a rapid response team. Please note that rapid response teams are generally not used in ERs or ICUs because all the resources that a rapid response team brings are usually already in the ER or the ICU. However, on, for example, a med surge unit, if a patient suddenly starts to have their blood pressure drop or starts to have signs of a stroke, you would absolutely call a rapid response team so that we can get all the necessary providers at the bedside to rapidly take care of the patient instead of waiting till they deteriorate further and then waiting to call a code blue. Defibrillation is giving a patient an electrical shock and it is meant to stop all electrical activity in the heart. This can be delivered via a defibrillator or an AED. It can also be delivered via an internally implanted defibrillator where the patient has one implanted in their chest in case they ever need it. Next, we're gonna talk about a pacemaker. A pacemaker also can be implanted internally or externally, and it's used for a variety of conditions that, we'll, we'll, that we will discuss in future lectures. Next, we have a cabbage or coronary artery bypass graft. That is surgery, and it's commonly referred to as open heart surgery or bypass surgery. When you hear those terms, the medical term for that is a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass graft. And you'll learn much more about this when we get to the cardiology section in med surge. Anticoagulation is the last term on this list. And this is when a patient is at risk for bleeding, we may take certain measures to prevent coagulation, to prevent them getting clots. This may be in the form of medication, or in the form of some nursing interventions, such as making sure to constantly be turning the patient to prevent clotting. Next, we're gonna look at some labs that we use in cardiology. A BNP, or beta natriuretic peptide, is used to assess for heart failure. A troponin is used to assess for signs of cardiac ischemia, more often uh, known as used to assess for a heart attack. A troponin is currently the first line most used and most evidence-based lab to assess if a person is having a heart attack. Cardiac enzymes refers to several labs. CK or creatinine phosphokinase is a group of labs. There are several subsets of this, such as CKMB or CKMM that are all considered cardiac enzymes. These have generally fallen out of favor because we are mostly using troponin. Electrolytes, you should already be familiar, familiar with this, such as our sodium, 
or our glucose or our potassium, many of these can cause cardiac problems. So you would often see labs such as a magnesium or a potassium level assessed in a patient that's having heart problems. A D-dimer is a test that assesses for blood clots, and a lipid panel is what we use to assess for cholesterol. A lipid panel is gonna give us four numbers, our total cholesterol, and the target for that is under 200, triglycerides, and our total for that should be under 150, LDL or low density lipoprotein should be under 100. And of note, there are some situations where a patient would want to have an even lower LDL if they have some conditions such as diabetes. Also note, LDL is what we use when we target a patient with medication. When we are treating a patient for cholesterol, the LDL is what we are looking to see come down. Finally, HDL, also referred to as the good cholesterol, and it stands for high density lipoprotein, should be over 50 in females and over 40 in males. I failed to mention, but LDL is also referred to as the bad cholesterol in layman's term. Let's talk about a few cardiac diseases, and we will discuss all of these much more in depth in the med surge lecture. Heart failure is where cardiac output cannot meet the body's demands. Angina is where cardiac oxygen demand exceeds supply. These are not interchangeable terms. Heart failure is where the overall volume of blood that is being pumped cannot keep up with what the body needs. Angina is where the heart itself has a higher oxygen demand than what the heart itself is giving itself. Hypertension is when our blood pressure exceeds what is considered appropriate, safe, and normal limits. Hyperlipidemia is when our cholesterol level exceeds, again, what is considered normal and safe. Arrhythmia refers to an abnormal cardiac rhythm. Atherosclerosis is an accumulation of lipids in the blood vessels that leads to the blood vessels becoming narrowed and becoming hardened. A myocardial infarction is also known in layman's term as a heart attack. An infarction refers to cellular death. A myocardial infarction is death of cardiac cells generally related to a lack of oxygen. Finally, if you're going to be treating a patient for anything related to cardiology, you will likely be educating them on non-pharmacological interventions, also referred to as lifestyle modifications. There are eight lifestyle modifications that are generally discussed with cardiac patients, and they're adopted from the AHA's Life's Essential Eight. These include increasing their activity level, so get more exercise, get an appropriate healthy amount of sleep, improve their diet, achieve and maintain a healthy weight, and that is based on their BMI, to stop smoking if they currently do, to manage their cholesterol, manage their blood pressure, and manage their blood glucose level. Keep in mind, there are other specific lifestyle modifications that you may be recommending based on specific issues, such as if a patient has high blood pressure, you may educate them to decrease their salt intake or if a patient has high cholesterol, you may be educating them to decrease their saturated fat intake. However, these eight interventions are what the AHA calls life's essential eight, and they're the primary risk factors for all adverse cardiac events. Here are the references for this lecture. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.